thanks very much and thanks for the invitation. Um, it's going to be a quick whirlwind tour through the world of what I regard as one of the orphans of, of prevention, post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, it's being triggered largely on the fact that WHO has released post-exposure prophylaxis guidelines recently, and I'm going to take you through those just and some of the rationale for some of the choices. Um, this, the Clinician Society has released um, guidelines and is in the process of updating its own, on the, but we actually delayed them so we could see what WHO put out. Um, and we'll be adapting them to mirror the WHO ones as much as possible, but they're very sensible, very clear, and, you know, take us and are contextually very important in terms of just um, addressing the region. The thing about guidelines um, is that they're guidelines. You know, they're supposed to guide. They're not tablets of the law. And unfortunately, um, the way they often get interpreted, particularly it's, uh, we find at the coalface, is that they, they are interpreted as rules rather than as guidelines. This was a photograph I took in the South African um, at, at the center of excellence that I supposedly work at, um, and which is which was up in the guide department. In it is um, advocacy for AZT three times a day. This post was put up last year. Um, and for Indinavir, which I don't think I'd give to my worst enemy, um, <laughs> they'll only stop HIV transmission. But it, it's bizarre to me that, that, at how these guidelines have stood the test of time, certainly in my own country. Um, our ER is um, occupational, non-occupational um, HIV exposure problem. Yes, of course it is. And it's, there are a huge number of traditional occupational exposures. There's actually very little data on the number, but we all just don't have to do this. To happen. We, we're just not going to get that level of data. The size of the studies as well as the complexity of the studies are such that for a very rare event in a difficult to find group, such as healthcare workers who don't listen to anything you tell them, it's going to be very difficult to, to run these studies. And that the kind of observational data that we have is the best we're going to get, as well as the, interestingly enough, the data that's increasingly coming out of the PrEP field. What's also falling away is occupational versus non-occupational. The, the principles are exactly the same. Is one of you healthcare workers helping in an accident outside at the side of the road, is that occupational? Is a burst condom for a sex worker, is that occupational? You know, those kind of things are, and the principles of treatment are exactly the same. The other thing that's changed is that third drugs are now much better, to, particularly with the rise of the integrase inhibitors, have meant that we've reevaluated how to use the third drug. So I just wrote these all down there off the website of all the various things that you know, the kind of things I get phoned. It's only professional guideline writers who think you get phoned up and said, I pricked myself with a 18 gauge needle from a patient whose viral load was 4,932 with the following resistance mutations. That's not how it works. It's I dropped the needle down my boot and I found it in the morning and I think I might pricked myself. And, you know, it's this kind of um, thinking, unfortunately, that if you read particularly um, some of the older versions of the developed country guidelines, you'd, you'd believe that that's a kind of clean way. And some of these I've put down here are obvious, but things like the cat scratch disease is my favorite one. This patient who I was given to where the gardener who was actually positive scratched the gardener and then scratched the madam who was trying to help the gardener. And they, so <laughs> the hijacker case is something that uh, was 
typical Joburg story, terrible story, where the hijacker's gun went off by mistake, went through his friend, killed his friend, and then lodged in the liver of the person who they were hijacking. Both of these cases, I consulted the literature carefully for the RCTs, looking at the cases, they, they just weren't there. And children just bite each other at nursery schools all the time. So I get phoned at least every three or four months by panic-stricken parents for post-exposure prophylaxis. So you need a way of dealing with all these complex situations, you know, that, that span the occupational, non-occupational world. And one of the things when it is classic occupational, particularly in the healthcare sphere, as uh, Mark Mendelssohn from Cape Town emphasizes again and again, it is management's fault when people prick themselves with needles in particular. And these overflowing uh, needle uh, bins and things like that, um, it's management's responsibility to make sure the work environment is, is safe and to make sure that hepatitis B is routinely available to healthcare workers. And really, we need to be stronger advocates for our own professions to say that the health, when we hear of somebody getting a needle stick and somebody saying you were stupid, um, to put it firmly at the feet of the people who need to take responsibility for that. This is the classic teaching in terms of exposure of risk. We've all been taught this about mucous membranes and needle sticks, and it's been heavily contested um, in the last few years, including by this paper, which put forward the fact that we need to start risk categorizing, even by sex act, the fact that anal sex is 33 times greater, um, risk, is riskier than, than, than vaginal sex. Um, that uncircumcised sex is much more, um, sex with somebody who's uncircumcised is much more risky than somebody who is circumcised. And that having an ulcerative STD at the time of having sex um, is, is obviously, you just heard the previous data, a, a, by itself indicative of, of transmission risk. And then we all know about the seroconversion wave. Um, this is actually a conservative estimation that it's about 2.5 times more likely to contract um, HIV during the seroconversion early phase of the disease, the first six months versus the sort of AIDS phases, uh, the midpoints, and then versus the AIDS phase, which is almost twofold increase. These numbers are all over the place. They depend on lots and lots of things, but you can see that it's not as a simple risk assessment. Um, and if you throw in a gonorrhea or something like that, the estimates from some point so that, uh, um, that the, the risk can climb to as high as one in three. Um, and if this is the new CDC risk table that was released last year, which is really, there's one thing I just want to draw your attention to. We routinely recommend HIV post-exposure prophylaxis for needle stick injuries. Now, I don't think anyone in the audience would balk at that. What's really interesting is Receptive anal sex has a much higher rate of transmission, yet we don't recommend that. We don't recommend post-exposure prophylaxis for this. And again, this conflation of uh, the sep this artificial separation of occupational, non-occupational HIV exposure makes no sense to me if what the basic thing is you want to stop the transmission of HIV. And you can see this beautiful table where they've granted, they, they acknowledge the fact that it's, it's messy data, but often based on a tiny number of them, um, of exposures, particularly in the case of things like mucocutaneous exposure. But you can see there that they, they put it out there exactly what they think of the risk of exposure, and particularly oral sex, where they say the risk is low, which is practically negligible in American speak, where you've got lawyers all over the place. So how effective is post-exposure prophylaxis? Its data's messy, but if you take this and extrapolating from the PrEP studies as well now, it seems to be well over 90% effective if you take it in time and you take it for the full course. We have this PrEP data, which, oh, sorry, I keep, um, um, we have this PrEP data that is now suggested that as ART, and often PrEP happens in the context of, of somebody taking PEP, and um, which suggests it's extremely effective as long as you take it. We have the data we're all familiar with, with 052, which shows that transmission almost is zero once people are on successful antiretrovirals. Um, we also know that tenofovir and FTC, where we have a lot of data now from the ba on the back of the PrEP studies, is very effective. AZT from the old 90s data from PEP was what was um, traditionally been the gold standard. There's lots of interest in the CCR5 blockers and integrase inhibitors um, in terms of them perhaps being an adjunct to all of this um, to making PEP better. It's interesting whether we're ever going to get data to really support their, their use is, is, is difficult to tell. But will we give up post-exposure prophylaxis for sexual exposure? And as I pointed out to you, we probably should if the point is to stop the transmission. It's a false thing to say we're only going to do it for mucosal splashes and for needle sticks when you have sexual acts which have much greater risk. Um, and that we, um, Terry, who gave a, a talk in the previous session, was talking about it this morning, is why don't we provide this like emergency contraception? Somebody 
has an exposure, they think they're going to fall pregnant, they worry they're going to fall HIV, why is this not available more generally? And you can argue, oh, we need to have the HIV testing before we push it out. But I can think of lots of good reasons why that actually is unnecessary and why we couldn't just make this available over the counter to people in the same way that Plan B is available in the States for people who, do, you know, who, who don't want to fall pregnant. Um, and should this be something we should be thinking about in our context? If we can't get the public health care system to do it, can't we make it more broadly available for the public, for populations that could afford it? I'm sure it is going to be expensive. I think I've mentioned how the occupational versus non-occupational thing is falling away, and WHO is actually taking it away. There is um, an area of focusing on health care workers, and that's partly is because there are specific things around needle sticks that, that need to be talked about in terms of risk assessment. But one of the things that was raised in the, uh, the society discussions was the major medical legal consequences of somebody contracting HIV in an occupational sphere. So if you prick yourself in, um, in a hospital and you take tenofovir and you go into acute renal failure, your claim against the state and against um, whatever the insurance companies are that are insuring you is that much higher. And therefore, the documentation of the injury is actually that much greater. So doing baseline creatinines and baseline hemoglobins and things like that, depending on what regimen you're using, may actually be important for this reason. We don't think it's particularly important in terms of safety. Um, but one final thing for healthcare workers, all concerned about their needle stick, is you're much more at risk at HIV off duty than on duty. Okay, think that, I, and it is something that gets constantly worried. Is I've looked after a huge number of HIV positive healthcare staff, nurses and doctors, and I think two or three of them managed to get it occupationally. You know, and it's kind of a discussion you have to have with them. It's like, you know, oh, now I caught it cuddling this baby ten years ago in the ward, and I'm like, so you've never had sex. It's like, no, 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 but I'm sure it's not that. And it's important that people do understand they are part of the general community. So who thinks they are at risk? Um, all of you will tell me that it's orthopedic surgeons and cardiothoracic surgeons, when in fact, there's never been a clear transmission documented in a surgeon. There's an iffy case in, um, in Spain around an obstetrician. There's also never been a documented case with a hollow needle, which is generally what surgeons use when they're stitching up their patients. Um, and we need to be... You must also remember that surgery is a very controlled environment. There's lights, there's the patients hopefully paralyzed when they, you're busy sticking your knife into them. That's not the situation in the accident emergency room or in casualty when patients are drunk or confused when they've got cryptococcal meningitis and moving around. And this is who is at risk. The number one risk group consistently are the lab techs because they're the ones dealing with huge numbers of specimens and they break them and the glass is sharp and they're at risk. Number two is junior nursing staff. They're the ones wandering around cleaning up after the doctors and pricking themselves on. And number three is the junior doctors who are the ones who are doing the actual work at the cold face, looking after the drunk patients and the cryptococcal patients. So when the orthopedic surgeon swans in and like, has broad, very confident pronouncements um, about their risk, you can remind them about the slide. I think as, as you get closer and closer to God, the less likely you are to get HIV. You see, this is a... Should we give a third drug? Okay, now this sounds on the face of it really easy. Um, the funny thing is that the data, even for one drug, is very strong. There's no data for the second drug. Luckily, the second drug is FTC or 3TC, which has got almost no side effects. It becomes important that we have no data on one versus two versus three drugs, and we probably will never know whether one or the others. It adds very little to prevention, but it does help us make things simpler if we add the third drug. And I must tell you, that I'm sure many of you have this ex experience, there's a huge amount of anxiety attached to, to these various um, drugs. The problem, though, is it comes at significant toxicity and cost. This was an SMS exchange I had with somebody this morning. I just, um, and she told me, she was somebody who's taking for a very severe exposure, that I need to tell you that she's feeling very, very sick on Alluvia. And as you can tell, she feels quite strongly that the side effects are very, very horrible. Um, and um, luckily, she's feeling a bit better this afternoon. When we did the WHO um, expansion, we did look at the fact that, um, in fact, interestingly, we, did the look, we looked at it in post-exposure prophylaxis. It seemed like the Alluvia-based regimens were safer than the Atazanivir um, ones. Efavirenz was very unpopular for all the reasons we know, which is around its CNS side effects. The integrase inhibitors are becoming more and more popular and are featuring commonly in co um, developed world um, regimens. But you've got to ask yourself, adding that third drug, let's say you took Alluvia and there's a 1 in 10,000 chance of getting a Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Is it worth the tiny, 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 tiny drop of... Um, with, um, that you would have in that process. So we looked at the WHO guidelines, and essentially it's a brilliant guideline to be on because there's no data for anything. So there's no like swanning around and teasing out the data because there's nothing to tease. 
Um, we recommended a two drug antiretroviral re regimen is effective, we said, but three drugs are preferred. And it was largely around this issue of it being simpler. We liked FTC and, and tenofovir, and we suggested lopinavir or atazanavir. Even though we thought lopinavir was better, we thought whatever was available, you should probably use. And where you had alternatives, you could use the integrase inhibitors or even durinavir, or efavirenz if that's all you had. For children, we recommended AZT and 3TC below the age of 10, then we added lopinavir. Um, we said you must take it for a full 28 days, and the only place where there was actually some data to support um, a, a recommendation was in adherence support. If you do adherence support, it's very good. I just want to finish with the last thing, which is the last, what about the giving it within 72 hours? Now, this has traditionally been taught based on mod animal models done in the 90s, but the Nature article that came out last year where they inoculated massive amounts of virus into the rectums of, of, of these luckless monkeys and then saw whether they became, even monkeys which had um, post-exposure prophylaxis after three days, 72 hours, um, became, inf every single one of them became infected. So 72 hours might not actually be as safe as we used to think, and this is just the, the, the data. So for slightly richer countries, I think we can dump the protease inhibitors, the third drug, and use the integrase inhibitors. For every, all the other suggestions around hepatitis B and that, I think are fairly conventional. So just to my last slide is the principles are similar. We need prevention, we need the management structures, we need everyone to vaccinate themselves against hepatitis B. We have to deal with anxiety. For me, this is the biggest thing, is anxiety management. Very little about it is about the science. Um, HIV and Hep B at baseline is very important, particularly in the occupational setting. You should discourage unnecessary tests, otherwise it's very expensive. It also gives very false reassurances. This includes things like viral loads and resistance testing. Try and get them to uh, fulfill the full 28 days. And don't dwell too hard on the two versus the three drugs. Um, and as I said, the one thing that we have evidence for is active side effect management. Thank you very much.